Have you noticed that it's been quite some time since Google hit a home run? Almost everything they've launched basically since Chrome back in 2008 has fallen flat of expectations or been a complete failure. This includes Google+, Plus, Google Glass, Google Cardboard, Google Fiber, Google Nexus, Google Allo, and most recently, Google Bard. But it's not just these new product launches that aren't going Google's way either. Even their hero products are starting to lose steam. Many people are switching to Edge, Bing, and ChatGPT instead of Chrome, Google, and Bard. More people than ever are also switching from Gmail to Outlook or even a third-party option like ProtonMail. And as for Android, well, the iPhone has been annihilating Android in terms of market share over the past 10 years. Even YouTube, one of their golden gooses, has started to show a few signs of weakness as revenue fell for three quarters in a row. Google has been aware of this shortcoming for quite some time now, and their solution was just brute force. Just keep launching new products and entering new sectors with initiatives like Google TV, Stadia, and YouTube Shorts, and hope that something ends up sticking. But unfortunately, nothing has really stuck, at least not in the mega scale that you would expect with a giant like Google. Amongst this graveyard of failures and disappointment though, there does seem to be one glimmer of hope, Google Cloud. It looks like Google has taken a page straight out of Microsoft's playbook. When consumer products don't work out because of public perception or too much baggage or whatever, just switch to offering enterprise products as businesses are far more logical. They just care about the product and the price. Your story and ethics is no concern to them as long as it doesn't affect their business. But unlike Microsoft who entered the cloud scene and made strides in the early 2010s, Google has had an extraordinarily difficult time breaking in. In fact, they were losing billions of dollars trying to chase the cloud market until the beginning of this year when they posted their first ever profit. And considering that 50% of all of Google's current job openings are for cloud roles, I'd say that it's safe to say that Google is very much doubling down on the enterprise cloud business. So join me as we take a look at Google's monumental shift from being a ubiquitous consumer business to being an enterprise juggernaut. Taking a look back, the story of Google Cloud takes us back to March of 2006 to the launch of AWS or Amazon Web Services. AWS would eventually grow to be the gold standard when it comes to the cloud. Virtually every esteemed company that you can think of has adopted AWS, including Airbnb, McDonald's, Twitch, Twitter, Epic Games, and even Netflix and Disney. In fact, some analysts estimate that AWS accounts for a trillion dollars worth of Amazon's market cap. This means that their massive retail operation that everyone actually knows about is only worth a few hundred billion dollars or a mere fraction of their entire valuation. But when Amazon launched AWS, they were by no means trying to create the next big thing. In fact, the launch of AWS was more of a desperate move than a calculated one. Amazon's retail business simply wasn't turning a profit, and with funding drying up due to the dot-com crash, they needed another source of revenue. Their solution was rather simple rent out their spare servers and databases, but this somehow turned into a trillion dollar business. Google was watching all of this play out in real time and naturally they felt that they could do it better. As such, in April of 2008, Google would enter the cloud scene with the launch of App Engine. App Engine had a pretty ambitious offer, make it easier than ever for developers to launch websites by leveraging the power of Google's infrastructure. They largely simplified the process of deploying code and managing traffic spikes. In fact, they completely removed these concerns from the equation as they would handle the stuff from their end. But not only was Google trying to make App Engine as easy to use as possible, but they were also trying to make it as cheap as possible. In fact, the original version didn't even have a paid option. Everyone got a generous free quota to mess around and test with. And naturally, given that this was from Google, they attracted a lot of developers, 20,000 to be precise. One month later, they would open up the service to all developers, and 10 months after that, they would add paid tiers to App Engine, but something was off. App Engine was 
by far the easiest to use and the cheapest, especially from a big tech company. But for some reason, developers just weren't sticking around. This was extremely confusing. Google had used this same strategy time and time again, usually to great success. Offering a better service for a cheaper price or free was literally the bread and butter of the entirety of Google. So why in the world weren't developers joining up in the masses? Well, the reality was that Google had gotten the developer community completely wrong, which is rather ironic given that Google themselves is just a bunch of developers. The problem was that in order to make the service as easy to use as possible, Google had to sacrifice a lot of customizability and performance. For Google to deliver on the ease of use aspect, they had to shrink the infinite developer landscape into a few succinct boxes because frankly, they could only address so many sectors. Also, remember how App Engine launched with only a free tier? Well, that tier was indeed generous for testing, but it was completely impractical for production applications. Combine this with CPU limitations, scaling issues, and slow response times, and developers were out before App Engine was even fully launched. The OG Google though wasn't afraid to keep trying despite failure, so it was only a matter of time until they put out a new offering. A year after the launch of App Engine, Google would add Java support, but this didn't change much. As this developer put it, there are a couple of fundamental issues that must be addressed and addressed properly before Google App Engine can be taken seriously as a web application platform. And no, Java support is most definitely not one of them. Google saw this and said, all right then, if it's not Java they want, maybe it's cloud storage. No. BigQuery and Prediction APIs? No. Cloud SQL? No. Um, 24-7 phone support? No. PHP support? No. Encryption? Still no. None of Google's additions to their cloud offerings over the next five years really did that much to attract the big boys. The bottom line was that the consumer approach did not work with developers and enterprise customers. Google was trying to offer a watered down version that was cheap and easy to use when developers preferred a fully customizable option which they were more than happy to pay for. So ironically, Amazon's bare bones offering that was infinitely customizable was actually far more appealing than Google's watered down assortment. This was super frustrating. Google was literally trying to create a new developer offering that was easier and more convenient than anything else on the market, but for some reason, developers preferred the less convenient stuff. Disappointed, Google would turn back to what they were good at, the consumer market. And with that, we would see the launch of Google Drive on April 24th, 2012. In classic Google fashion, they launched with 5GB of free storage which quickly grew to 15GB and Drive would take off. Within 3 years, they would grow to 1 million paying users. By 2017, they would reach a milestone of storing over 2 trillion files and by 2018, they would reach 1 billion active users. By all accounts, Google Drive was a massive success. but. Google couldn't help but feel that they had missed out on the larger pie, the enterprise market. Sure, reaching 1 billion users directly was great, but with a cloud operation like AWS, they could literally reach trillions of users across hundreds of ubiquitous platforms. This feeling was only made worse by Microsoft and their surprising success with Azure, which came out years after App Engine. Also, Microsoft wasn't trying to do anything revolutionary with Azure like Google was. Their entire pitch was basically just, here's AWS, but for cheaper. Google was furious, and in 2014, they decided that if they couldn't fight their way to the top, they were going to buy their way to the top. This plan was twofold. On one side, they would literally buy out smaller cloud providers and their users like with Firebase. On the other side, they would subsidize their cloud offerings by a ridiculous amount. In fact, they would slash prices of all cloud offerings between 30 and 85%. Surely, this was a deal that was simply too good to refuse. Until customers refused. The harsh reality was that no company was taking Google's offering seriously. 
Moreover, they saw no reason to switch when there were already two great offerings, AWS and Azure, one that was focused on performance and one that was focused on price. Google just didn't fit in the picture, and now that they had largely cut prices, they were burning ridiculous amounts of money. During the worst of it, they were losing $5.5 billion per year on cloud alone. Sundar would desperately try to convince investors that Google Cloud should be judged based on growth instead of financials. But investors weren't convinced, as the growth wasn't even all that remarkable compared to the real winners in the first place. To make things worse, this was the era in which all of Google's new consumer offerings would also start flopping. Google needed change, and they needed it fast. Enter Thomas Kurian. To be honest, Google got extraordinarily lucky with Thomas Kurian. If you're not familiar with Thomas, that's understandable as he spent most of his career in the background. But that isn't to say that his contributions were anything short of extraordinary. After working a few years as a consultant early on in his career, Thomas joined Oracle in 1996. And over the next 12 years, he would work his way all the way up to president of Oracle reporting directly to Oracle's founder and CEO, Larry Ellison. Thomas was like the dream candidate for Google, as he had literally spent his entire career building up the biggest enterprise tech company in the world, Oracle. He was in charge of 35,000 developers, deca billion dollar budgets, and was basically the de facto CEO of Oracle Cloud. But while Thomas was the perfect candidate to lead Google Cloud, Google really had no shot at getting him. For starters, why would he want to leave the world's most successful enterprise tech company where he was already the main guy to go lead the struggling Google Cloud? It makes no sense whatsoever. If you're thinking that Google could just bribe him with money, this is also false because he has no need for money. We always talk about how Google is a top paying employer and how Sundar Pichai is the highest paid employee in the world, but all I can say is that Thomas has already been there and done that. In fact, Thomas was the world's fifth highest paid tech executive way back in 2010 before Sundar was even a thing. And by 2018, Thomas was earning just under $100 million per year. So at this point, all that was left for Thomas was to become a C-suite executive or even CEO, potentially earn even more than Sundar Pichai, work for another 10 years in a familiar comfortable environment, and retire as an Oracle legend. But obviously, things didn't play out that way. That's why we're even talking about Thomas. You see, around the same time that Google desperately needed help, Thomas and Larry would get into a massive argument over the future of Oracle Cloud. Thomas felt that Oracle should run more of their software on AWS and Azure to reach as many customers as possible, while Larry felt that they should run Oracle software on their own cloud to bolster the usage of Oracle Cloud. This petty disagreement would quickly be blown out of proportions, and on September 28, 2018, Thomas would announce that he was resigning from Oracle and that he was actively searching for new opportunities. This was straight up a blessing from God for Google. During a time in which they needed more help than ever before, one of the most qualified cloud executives in the entire world was looking for a job. Likely the only people in the entire world who were more qualified than Thomas were Andy Jazzy, now the CEO of Amazon, and Mark Rusonovich, the CTO of Azure. So Google lucked out with the third best option in the entire world out of nowhere. Yeah, I don't think you'd be surprised to hear that Thomas would be hired as a Google Cloud CEO at the start of 2019. But it was by no means a smooth road ahead, as Thomas was literally taking over a money bit. Thomas says that the main issue at Google Cloud wasn't that hard to spot once he joined. The problem was that Google was focused on creating sophisticated technologies when the key was to build straightforward, reliable solutions. So the first order of business was shifting the mindset from we're a tech company to we're a solutions company. As such, instead of hiring a bunch of developers, Thomas would hire a bunch of sales engineers and solutions architects. These guys are in charge of engaging with current and new customers and addressing all of their questions and concerns regarding how Google can accomplish what they're hoping for. To really solidify this mindset shift, Thomas would also acquire some up-and-coming cloud companies. 
His most notable acquisitions were Looker for 2.6 billion and Mandiant for 5.4 billion. All of these internal changes helped tremendously in terms of product development and sales, but likely Thomas's biggest play was finding a new distinguishing factor. As we previously touched on, AWS is desired for its performance, Azure is desired for its price, and Google was trying to be desired for its ease of use. But what they figured out the hard way was that developers don't actually care about ease of use all that much if it comes at the cost of performance or customizability. So what Google needed was a new distinguishing factor, and that's when Thomas stumbled upon the open source cloud market. Open source platforms like MongoDB and Elasticsearch were not only having trouble competing against the likes of AWS, but they were actively being attacked by the likes of AWS and Azure. Seeing this, Thomas knew exactly what their distinguishing factor would be. They would be the champion of open source cloud solutions. With that, he would form a partnership with seven of the most popular open source solutions. This gave developers the tremendous power of the Google infrastructure as well as the insane freedom and customization offered by these open source platforms. And that was it. That was the turning point which finally started attracting large clients, including Coinbase, Deutsche Bank, Ford, General Mills, and SpaceX. In fact, Google Cloud is now performing even better than their ad business, which has become stagnant. Google Cloud now also accounts for one fourth of Google's entire workforce, and judging by their open roles, they're only looking to grow this bigger. And speaking of growing bigger, they have plenty of space to do so, as they still only control about 10% of this market. All of this brings us back to Google's original issue, which is that none of their recent consumer products have been sticking, and their existing ones are starting to lose steam. This is not a good omen for any company, but luckily for Google, it seems like they have built out a solution to grow past their consumer days, just like Microsoft did a decade ago. So while Google's future in the consumer market is indeed looking bleak, their future in the enterprise market is looking brighter than ever, and that's why the cloud is the future of Google. Speaking of consumer products that are losing steam, ChatGPT's accuracy has really fallen off a cliff. Check out this video to learn more, but until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.